We're just really honored for you to come on and be our guests. Um, so Alicia and Sam, would you mind uh, introducing yourselves? My name is Alicia Nagichi. I'm a fourth year graduate student at Northwestern University in the de uh, chemistry department. I'm originally from, originally from Brooklyn, New York, and I, yeah, what else should I include? Where'd you go to college? That sounds great. I went to Spelman College, a uh, historically Where? black college, all female college in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, I'm uh, Samantha. Um, I grew up in Southern California. I'm from um, Huntington Beach, California. Uh, and I went to University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA for undergraduate. And now I'm here pursuing graduate studies at Northwestern. What led you both on this pathway? Uh, you know, what, what kind of sparked your interest in the beginning and what has kept you going up to this point? Um, so Samantha, do you mind starting first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that really I, I just, clicked with chemistry in high school. So a lot of the high school chemistry courses, I think mainly focus on like uh, reaction sequences and like learning a little bit of the periodic table. And it just all seemed good to me. It was a little bit of math, a little bit of memorization, um, but a lot of like intuition. And I, I think that's what I liked about the high school chemistry classes. Um, and so from then on, I just kept on trying to, to seek out those types of, of classes that I liked. Awesome. Uh, and, and, and Alicia, did you, did you have some kind of an initial spark? Um, so I don't know if there was really an initial spark. It was kind of something that was always there. So my interest, so I'll start with my favorite question is always why and then right. how. And so my parents, I think, got annoyed with me asking those questions so often <laughs> how things worked and they didn't know answers, so they set me up in a lot of programs um, to really explore the world around me and understand how things worked. So one of the earliest experiences I had was at the Museum of Natural History. Um, my parents woke me up at you know 6 a.m. on Saturday uh, mornings to go and be with the dinosaurs and understand a lot of um, you know, geological uh, questions and to really explore the, the question of how and why we all got to be here. And so I kind of carried that passion and that interest and curiosity along through uh, high school where I really excelled in both chemistry and English. And I, by the time I got to college, I really had to decide on which I could live with as a passion and which I could live with as a hobby. Um, and so I decided to pursue chemistry because number one, I was pretty good at it, but it also really sparked um, you know, a lot of interest in me. And so what's kept me going is that there's always more, there are almost always more whys, you know, always more hows. There's never really a closed book on any question. And so that's really what's propelled me into you know, uh, continuing to study chemistry now. Is there is there a single uh, thing right now that you're asking why about? Like, is there a sig like a singular like burning passion or, or question that you're just trying to answer that's like the 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 forefront of of like your mind right now? So yes and no. So yes, um, for completing my degree, there is a burning question I'm trying to answer. But um, I usually think more broadly. Once it's kind of a rabbit hole, you go down, you think of a question, and then that question kind of spirals into another question and it really just evolves into a much more complex question than you really set out to answer. Um, but right now we're trying to understand in my group, so I'm in Franz Geiger's group here at Northwestern, we're trying to understand how very small materials can impact biological systems. And so how we can change those, those materials and how we can uh, use them in a sustainable way. So we have a lot of questions there. Um, but I'm really curious still about everything. I, I do read up on psychology studies and I still look at, you know, uh, environmental qu uh, chemistry questions and things like that. So. Great, Sam. Do you do you have something that's like a, a burning question currently? Yeah, Alicia described it perfectly. Like the entire PhD process is like a rabbit hole of question after question. So you start with one maybe simple one, and mine was, uh, can we make new functional materials? Um, so materials like battery materials or um, just anything you, you, you use in like electronics and stuff at high pressures. So pressures comparable to the inside of the earth. And as we made more and more materials, then you start asking, 
why does this one form in this way? And why does this one form in that way? And why do they have the properties they have? And and that's kind of the same thing. They You end up with so many questions at the end of every day. Um, yeah. So yeah, now I'm trying to figure out why they form in the way they do. Awesome. Um, and and um, Alicia, we, we had kind of uh, just a question about um, your experience with NASA. And I know you you had interned with them a, a few times. Um, what was like the, the initial um, kind of draw to, to working with NASA and can you just describe your experience just overall? I think they just want to hear a little bit general background about it. Okay, so um, my first experience with NASA was really at, well obviously we all you know are really curious about space when we're young or want to understand what's beyond the stars we can see and you know what's just outside of our, our a cloud of earth. Um, but my first actual direct experience with, was with NASA in um, college. And so I was went to an inter, uh, information session on a scholarship program that they had at that time, which was uh, titled Women in Science and Engineering. And so the draw there was that they provide a scholarship on top of the internship. Um, and so okay. not wanting to really pass up on both, you know, experiences, the fellowship and the um, scholarship, I really decided to pursue that there. And so I interned three summers at three different places. Uh, initially, I started off at um, Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, then I worked in New York at the Goddard Institute for, for Space Studies, which is partnered with Columbia, where we okay. looked at more environmental questions, not really Earth studies, uh, space studies, and then at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. So Sam also interned at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So she has a, some experience there as well. But overall, the experience was great. You get to really explore questions that you wouldn't think that you might. And one of the questions that I um, addressed in my summer research um, is really what motivated me to go to graduate school. So one summer, the one that, summer I worked in New York, I looked at <clears throat> this, this uh, core sample, which is just to under, uh, literally just a sample of the earth uh, to try and understand uh, what the composition of this land was and why it might be so important for us to preserve. So in Brooklyn, there's one remaining marsh that was going to be paved over and turned into a parking lot. And so, you know, obviously we wanted to protect that land. It was, uh, you know, the, the, the home for four native species of birds there. And so we were able to halt the construction on that land because of the information that we provided at the time. Wow. So it was a really great experience with NASA, you know, to learn that they don't only do you know, space shuttle launches and I don't know, sending people to Mars and the moon. So it, that was a great question. I really valued, um, it was a really invaluable experience with NASA. Yeah, it seems like it, it opened you up to a lot more of like the broad uh, scope that, that NASA actually has uh, and different things. Sam, did you want to talk about your experience and, and what, what brought you to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory? Yeah, so um, mine was more coincidental. Um, so in uh, at UCLA, I started working for um, Professor Kaner, um, who has a collaboration already set up with NASA, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, because they're very close to one another. And when I joined the lab, I, I knew that I wanted to work on materials, and I wanted to work on materials that um, had you know, relevant applications to current technologies. And so I I was very interested in that project. And then, um, so the, well, the material is called a thermoelectric material and it converts um, heat to electricity. And um, so yeah, I started working on it at the school and then I was told like, oh, there's this awesome summer program that you can apply for. Um, and yeah, that's the summer we ended up spending at JPL. Um, we're going to open up to, to some of the student questions now. Um, Aiden, I don't know if your mic is on. Um, Aiden, do you want to come on and ask your question? Um, so, what was your favorite part of working with NASA? What was, whoever wants to take it first, what was your favorite part of working for NASA? So, my favorite part, I have, I have so many favorite parts. One of my favorite parts was actually going into a marsh uh, for the first time because you it's just a different experience. I don't know if anyone's been to New York, but to imagine that there is a marsh in the middle of New York that you can walk into and see sparrows and canoe in and 
you know, to really explore that landscape. And it's, it's magical. It's like having a, a literal jungle in the concrete jungle. So that was really one of my favorite, favorite experiences. So um, I was lucky enough to work at NASA the summer that the Mars rover landed on Mars. And wow. probably the most amazing part of that summer was having this big get together and everyone watching the landing happening together and everyone being just so wildly excited about, uh, you know, the success of that project, which took, you know, thousands and thousands of people, years of work to complete. And then uh, for the rest of the summer or most of the summer, they had uh, an exact replica of the rover um, on the campus that you could go and see. And so that was just really inspiring how, you know, teamwork like that, just a, a group of people putting their mind together to, to do something can just be so successful. And then again, it speaks to like the scope of that, that both of you have had such different, uh, like memorable experiences, uh, looking at the scope of what, what NASA actually provides and, and the experiences that you, you have to kind of be open to and the experience. And um, so that's just wonderful. Um, Cynthia, um, I wanna see if your mic's on, if you wanna go ahead and go ask your question. Um, so uh, what level of chemistry did you do in high school? So I just did the general chemistry track. In New York, it's a bit different. Um, we had to do these things called regions, which were annual evaluations for different courses. So we only really had chemistry and then AP chemistry, which I did not take. But I did take AP physics, which was actually really useful. Um, I think probably more manageable for me at the time than AP chemistry. Yeah, I took um, AP chemistry and AP physics as well. Um, awesome. I, I also took the general, general chemistry. You had to take the general one in order to get into the AP course. Um, so it's just a lot of classes. But um, Garav, are you uh, are you there? What is the most fun part of your job? That's hard. So the most fun part of my job is I get to work with lasers every day, and it's really cool wow. to see. That's yeah, a really, really fun cool job. Different colors that you can get just by changing a few mirrors around and. Sometimes, you know, you accidentally burn things, which is always fun. Um, so it's really, it, it really impresses my parents. So that's another fun thing. I like to impress my parents. That's the most fun part for me. Um, so yeah, I, I think the most fun part of my job is just working with other people um, in, in my group and in other groups and in other national labs, just the, the whole collaborative environment is amazing um and then the second thing i'd say is i also get to work with something cool but i get to work with diamonds so to make to put things under pressure to make things under pressure you actually just squeeze them between diamonds since diamond is the hardest known material and so i just get to have all these beautiful diamonds and i don't know it's awesome playing with them <laughs> playing with diamonds and playing with lasers is the best exactly. part of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Heather, uh, I don't know if your mic's on, Heather, but Heather had a few questions. Uh, Heather, are you there? What what specific colors do you make with the lasers? Okay, so I've made orange. So that is pretty much the standard color that we usually use. We also got into reds and some oranges or uh, some yellows and greens, which are really nice. Um, we did try to get to blue, but that's a little bit more difficult to achieve, but we did get reds, oranges, yellows, and greens. What makes it what makes it difficult to achieve? Well, it's not really difficult to achieve. It's just difficult for us to. Uh, um, okay, so a lot of LEDs in electronics around the rooms are blue, so we can't really tell whether it's what we're looking for or if it's some background noise, something from in the room that's contributing. So that's really so it's hard to decipher if it's uh, if it's truly like the color that's being made or if it's something else producing that. Right. So that's one thing I I also had to get over my fear of the dark um, very recently because I have to okay. work in complete darkness to see oh, wow. anything. Uh, so that's another another thing. We get to play with lasers in the dark, so that makes it even more fun. It's like laser tag. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, Heather just had that question, which was. Uh, for fun, do you guys get to play laser tag together? <laughs> okay, so no, so no, we don't. Um, it's really dangerous. Uh, so 
to work with lasers, like the ones we work with, you have to get special training. And it's really dangerous for your eyes and your skin. These things can actually burn your skin and clothes, so you want to be careful. So we never direct them at anyone. We never look, uh, la look at a laser beam directly. Uh, so we always use you know, fancy materials in lab that will allow us to see the beam. It'll be our eyes for us so we don't ruin our vision. So no, and safety first, OK? Safety first. <laughs> So that's what we always preach here. Um, Heather, did you, you had another question. Did you want to come on and ask the one about uh, Starbase? Have you ever gone to Starbase or any other NASA uh, NASA made programs? It was, it was just from college on that we really had our experiences with NASA. Um, yeah. Beyond you know just things we might see on TV or learn in the classroom, uh, we haven't actually been. Yeah. Okay. But I do have one thing on that. Um, if any of you really are interested in NASA and you're, um, I think, eligible, there is something called Space Camp, which they have in um, Alabama, which I, I loved Alabama. That was a, a great place to be. So you can go and learn about what astronauts do and do fun experiments. And it's really a great time. I think it's maybe six weeks or eight weeks during the summer. So you should look into that. That's on their website. Awesome. Yeah, and I know, I know there was a lot of chatter uh, leading up to this about like some of the students that had just been to space camp and they were super excited to just one hear from from the both of you. But um, yeah, they were saying like that how much they really enjoyed their experiences and how much it um, and interested them and in, and in continuing to kind of learn about it and pursue it later on. Um, Garaf, you had a question about the laser. You want to come on? How hot is a laser? So that's a good question. I'd imagine it's pretty hot since it burns things, um, but I don't know. I've never measured the temperature. Do um do do different colors have vary in temperature? Um, maybe. So the one thing that we the only temperatures we actually measure in the lab really have to do with the things that are producing the light that allows us to uh, pull, pump the laser. So to actually see the light that we ultimately get out. And those things are kept pretty cool. Um, so okay. something like uh, negative 20 degrees or something like C. So you want to keep things pretty cool. So it's pretty counterintuitive. I imagine the light is pretty warm, though. Great. Uh, Aiden, did you want to come on and ask a question? Do you want to work for NASA after you graduate? So I would love yeah. <laughs> to go back to JPL and work for NASA after I graduate. Um, I also, um, there are these other things in the United States called national labs, uh, which are not NASA, but they're similar in, their, in that they're all working towards a common goal usually. Um, and they're all doing research towards a common theme. And so I would, I would really like to work uh, either at a national lab or even a NASA lab. I'd love to go back to NASA. I, yeah, NASA was just probably the best place that I've ever really worked. I mean, and I've worked quite a few places. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to work for NASA if they'd have me. Awesome. Uh, Cynthia had a kind of question. Cynthia there? Um, why did you pick a PhD chemistry instead of space engineering? So I am doing environmental chemistry. And the reason I did environmental chemistry is because of one of the experiences I talked about briefly, which was um, working in New York for Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Uh, that summer, I got to do some really cool work. In addition to the work I described already, I also got to um, kind of develop a timeline for how this land prog um, progressed in Alaska. And so to really track how the land changed over 11,000 years. So that was pretty cool. And so I really wanted to understand a lot of environmental chemistry questions and uh, some problems that we might be having in the environment. And so that really motivated me to study environmental chemistry. Uh, space studies, while cool, it wasn't really what I was interested in. I was interested in more things, things that were closer to home for me. And closer to home was more of the environmental chemistry problem. Yeah, um, so similar, uh, I I've just have a passion for materials, and so I'm studying materials chemistry or inorganic chemistry um, and trying to make new materials that can be used to improve the existing ones, you know, that are used on the space shuttle, that are used on the Mars rover. Um, and so I, I, 
I think I just followed the materials passion and want to work with the space program, not directly, you know, doing the aerodynamics and and figuring out how to get into space, but on improving the materials that they use to make the spacecraft. Oh, one thing I want to add is that so it's this is kind of interesting in that we didn't either one of us studied aerospace engineering. Yeah. But to make things work with NASA, like any great project, you need people from different backgrounds. And so it's really important to understand how, you know, the environment might change or what materials might be necessary to work here versus on Mars versus on, you know, any other planet or, you know, uh, so in any atmosphere, you really want to have a diverse group of people who contribute to solving that problem. And so everyone shouldn't be an aerospace engineer. Yeah. You should have other people who really understand different aspects of the problem. Yes. NASA probably hires someone from every single scientific discipline background that you can imagine. So there's probably biologists to figure out, you know, is the rover going to have any biological things on it when it flies to Mars? That's going to really weird things out if it does, right? Um, they probably botanists. Botanists, everyone. They, they probably have yeah. whatever science you're interested in. If you're passionate about it and you pursue it, you can work for a NASA facility probably. Wonderful, and I think that's a, a great message on, on both levels of, of the fact that, you know, um, we don't wanna kind of be too isolated in our minds and, and wanna be like open to uh, our own path kind of way of like really diving in deeply into something and then finding that if you really truly enjoy it and you're passionate about it, going with that instead of just kind of having this one mindset the entire time. Um, but also understanding that um, uh, sciences have a lot of complexities to them uh, and that we can't just think of NASA as one kind of uh, like isolated uh, field of science that it involves everything, especially when you're talking about uh, the rover and anything else that we're talking about, other planets or materials, uh, it being involved in all of that. Um, so I think we have time for like one more question before we ask our, our last one, um, which is uh, for Samantha. And uh, it's Heather. Uh, so Heather, did you want to ask your uh, your diamond question? Is the last question. What kind of diamonds do you use? Like the colors or the size? That's a great question. Um, so the diamonds we use are natural diamonds. So they're just like any other piece of jewelry. They're mined out of the earth. And um, usually, uh, before using them, someone tests them with a laser to see how much nitrogen is in them. So how much of a different atom is in them. And that will tell you um, how well they're going to, how hard they're going to be. Um, the tell size, them. what? Tell them what diamonds they usually have, what atoms they usually have. So the diamonds are usually made purely of carbon. And so nitrogen is an impurity. And so depending on the amount of nitrogen, will will tell you how hard it is um, and how good your diamond will work for your experiment. Uh, the size, is large. Um, I don't think in inches anymore. It's <laughs> <laughs> like two millimeters. Two millimeters is or like a, a an eighth of an inch. inch. Yeah, yeah, like an eighth or a fifth of an inch. Um, so yeah, like a like a big wedding ring, <laughs> like a really big engagement ring. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of what else has diamonds. Um, you would see. Yeah, as a kid. Hannah wanted to know: Do you get to keep them when you're done with them? <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. I wish. So every <laughs> once in a while, a diamond will break. Um, it'll get a small crack in it, and it'll no longer be useful. But unfortunately, I do not get to hold on to the diamonds, oh. although I would love to. <laughs> would be intensive enough to, to 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 study that field, right? Yeah. Um, the last question we have is, uh, and we ask this to everybody, is um, is the role of of failing in like your pathway um, because we want uh, students to kind of know that um, it's okay to fail sometimes and that um, it, it's how you kind of persevere from that. So can can either of you or both of you um, think of a time that you've failed in your pathway leading to this moment and, and uh, share just like a little bit of an experience about, um, you know, what you took from that and how you kind of persevered from there? I mean, yeah, so, my entire first and second years of grad school, I was working on a project and I'm trying to, I was trying to make this new material and I just tried everything 
that my mind could think of and everything that I could read about, you know, and I just was unable to make it. And so it really teaches you, you know, it, it's probably could be achieved by someone, someone else maybe in the future, or maybe if I had worked on it for another year, but um, it teaches you hard work doesn't always pay off at the end of the day. Um, but the real, you know, key is to just learn, learn from your experiences, you know, learn from that failure, try as hard as you did on the next thing you do. And, and it, that's for me, it worked out It ended up working great the next thing I did. Right. And I, and it was totally rewarding. Um, so yeah, just everything is a learning experience and you just gotta, you know, keep pushing forward with it. And Garo wants to know, is that the hardest project you ever had, Sam? Um, I, well, it was certainly the one that I got the least results out of. Um, I mean, okay. I consider everything I think a PhD student does it is difficult and time consuming and, you know, uh, but it's hard in that there was no immediate reward from it. You know, you, you didn't get a publication. You didn't get a presentation from it. There was just, you learned a lot, but that like you, you don't get any like physical reward from it. And that was the hardest part. Sure. Alicia, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, I was gonna, oh, so yes, I'm gonna say that I have some of the same exact situations as Sam. Um, just, you know, a lot of difficulties in the lab, but one of the, it wasn't a real failure in that I got an F on something. It was a failure that I felt personally was a failure. Um, it was, I had an oral exam here at school and I didn't really do as well as I, as I wanted to do. And so I felt like I failed. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the times, you know, before I got to graduate school, failure seemed to be the end of the world for me. I, I really didn't know how to handle failure well. Um, and so coming to graduate school, I really had to learn how to cope with failure since it's going to be something that is ever present. So I, instead of focusing on that failure, I decided to outline a plan on how I could improve, what, where I failed, why I failed, and how I can make things better so I never failed again in the same way. And so after that exam, I went and signed up for a public speaking class, which I am, yeah, public speaking is I think everyone's, almost everyone's, you know, uh, biggest fear and they're most uncomfortable in that area. But I signed up for this class, I went through with it, and I gave a, pres a big presentation, which, you know, um, everyone loves and ended up on YouTube. So I, I guess I have to live with it now. But yeah, that was definitely one of the biggest, I think, failures I had here. And that's how I came overcame it. Well, I mean, I think those are, are both wonderful examples of just um, the, the fact that, uh, you know, every, everybody comes to a place and, and obviously you both are at um, some of the highest levels uh, within your fields right now. Um, and for them sometimes, and for even for uh, for me and, and, and the people around, they see uh, students like yourselves as people that like just know everything. Uh, and and I think it's important sometimes to have these conversations, uh, especially with students uh, like the students we have, um, because uh, failure is fine. It's great. It's a part of the process, and it's what you learn from that. Um, and and Samantha, in your case, it, I'm sure that your failure in that moment, um, the fact that people don't have to test some of those materials again is a success in itself, right? You, you know, they're, they're going to be learned from your work and, and that. And uh, obviously, Alicia, that what you learned from, uh, you know, from your perception of the failure that you had obviously led to a big success and uh, YouTube uh, stardom. Uh, so <laughs> I really, uh, I really appreciate both of you um, sharing those moments. And I know I, I'm I hope that um, some of the students can kind of learn from that uh, from themselves and, and when they get to those moments uh, can kind of remember uh, the pathways that both of you have forged uh, ahead of them. Um, so with that, um, that's kind of our final question. And, uh, and I know uh, everybody on here has been already saying thank you so much. So we really appreciate um, you taking the time out of your day and, and we wish you nothing but uh, the greatest luck in the world. And we're gonna continue to follow uh, both of you on your journey and and hope sometime we can get you back on to, to have a conversation. Definitely. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you.